Well, good morning. I see you've already met my colleague, Mike Lee. He's a good guy, and uh, we do a lot of things together and work on a lot of projects together. You might be scratching your head and asking yourself, what is a libertarian doing talking to a bunch of evangelical students? Aren't libertarians crazy? <laughs> Aren't they kind of scary? And uh, I think it's a misconception sometimes because uh, when you hear the word libertarian, you think, well, gosh, libertarians, they want anything goes, right? No rules, no laws, you can do whatever you want. And it's not exactly what we advocate. Libertarians do advocate freedom, liberty. We advocate government ought to leave you alone and that you ought to get to make choices on your own. But uh, would that mean lawlessness? Would that mean no rules, anything goes? Well, even libertarians believe in some sort of uh, rules. And so one of the rules that libertarians believe in is something called the non-aggression principle. And this is a principle really that you, when you hear it, you'll say, well, gosh, that, most government is founded upon this. The non-aggression principle means that under a libertarian society, if we had one, you pretty much could do whatever you wanted as long as you didn't hurt somebody else. So as long as you didn't invade their sphere of their rights, you could kind of do what you wanted. And you say, well, gosh, then there still would be all kinds of crazy things. Everybody would be doing heroin, there'd be prostitution, there'd be all these things. And really many of us who are Christian and libertarian believe that not only would you be restrained by government from doing things that would harm somebody else, but that a libertarian society or even a republic as we were intended to be would have some kind of restraint. And uh, some people have described it as uh, virtue. Washington described the beginning of the Republican. He said it would be necessary for our country to succeed to have virtue. So you'd have the idea that the government would restrain you from harming other individuals, but there has to be something that also guides us, that uh, keeps us uh, on the straight and narrow, allows us to cooperate as a civilized society, allows us to be an advanced society. Think of it this way. Uh, there are laws against stealing, and there should be, but how many in here would steal if there were not a law? against stealing. Oh good, I'm glad we don't have any thieves here today. Uh, but the thing is, is most of us don't steal. Most of us don't rape, murder, do all these horrific things, not because there's a law against it, but because we have a sense of right and wrong. We have a moral compass. We have something grounded in religion. We, we have this, this sense of virtue. And you think, well, how many people have this? And that's sort of the question of where a society goes over a long period of time. Uh, some would argue that we had more virtue 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It may or may not be true, but there's at least some argument to that. Some who look at Europe say that they have abandoned religion and they've gone, they've become much more secular, and they've also be, they've sort of lost their sense of, of right and wrongs in some ways. So really you have to have both. You have to have a government that restrains you from harming someone, but you also want to have a people that is a virtuous people. There's a theologian by the name of Oz Guinness, and he puts it this way. He says that liberty requires restraint, but the only restraint consistent with liberty is self-restraint. And so the, the reason why that's important is we often see, particularly from Christians, they come to Washington and they say, government needs, we've got all these terrible, immoral things happening, government has to fix them. When in reality, it may be that there are some things that do need fixing that perhaps we can't fix. And I'll give you an example. The number one correlation, causation, whatever you want to have it, with poverty in our country. If we say we want to wipe out poverty, what's the number one thing that is linked to poverty in our country? It's having children before you're married. Now, I'm not here to moralize or tell you, you know, what's right or wrong. I'm just here to tell you that is the number one link. If you look at charts, there's a book by Charles Murray called Coming Apart at the Seams, and he does two categories of charts on everything, all the socioeconomic, all the income, everything about your life, and there are two tracks. One, people who don't finish high school and have children before they're married, and they're here along the bottom of the, the, the x-axis. And then you see at the very top of our society, the, the top elite, and this, not every, these aren't all true, but they're mostly true, they're just generalizations, people who finish college and wait to have kids. But then you say, well, what's government going to do about this? I can't make you wait. So really, sometimes when I, when I greet with a group of ministers, they say, what are you going to do to make us a better, more moral nation? I say, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and really, there has to be some of that. And I think there has to be this realization the government can't do everything for you. You have to be part of it. And it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean that virtue is not important. It doesn't mean that we don't want virtuous people in government. But it means that government's not going to make us a virtuous society. And I think that's very important when we think about what we want from government and where we're going. A second way of looking at this would be on the idea of rights. 
So the right to be left alone, the right to practice your religion, the right to have property, the right to have speech, all of these rights that are sort of in the Bill of Rights. Did the government grant you these rights or did they pre-exist government and the government guarantees these rights? And it's very important when we look at rights because many of us who uh, see the Founding Fathers and talk about the idea of natural rights or God-given rights, we think they're innately yours. The, the right to speak, to practice your religion, to keep the fruits of your earning, these are, these are yours, they're just inherently yours. Now you say, well, we have to give up something to be in a society, right? Well, there are certain things, like for example, your property. As you go out and you earn your check and you get your check and you've worked two weeks, a portion of it's taken by the government. And you say, well, aren't they taking my stuff? Well, they are, and we have this idea, maybe not explicit, but we have this idea of a social compact. So you say, we're gonna live in a civilized world and part of my check's gonna be taken. And so we kind of implicitly agree to this, but if at the end of two weeks you were to make $600, and you got your check and it said minus $600 and your net was zero, how many people would like living in that society? Then 100% of your, the fruits of your labor would belong to government and would be taken from you. So the question always is when we look at issues like this, whose money is it? Well, I think it's yours. Are you willing to give up some of it? Yes, but I want to minimize how much I give up it because I want to maximize my freedom and my ability to either give it to my church, help the people in my community, or help my family. And so really it's always a question of maximum or minimum. How much government do you want? You want the least amount of government that we need because the more government you have or the more of your paycheck you give up, the less of your freedom you have. And so this is the tug of war, but I think it's a, a, an interesting way of looking at it when you try to decide, do you want more government or less government? Do you want government to do X or Y? Is government good at doing things? You ask yourself, if you have $100, if each of you had $100 and you were going to give it to somebody, if you thought, I really want to help people, would you give it to the federal welfare system, or would you give it to the Salvation Army? I wouldn't hesitate for a second. There's no way I would send a dollar up here that I didn't have to, because they're just not very good at it. They're so far away from the people that can't do it, but I can see in my community what the Salvation Army does. I can go to the homeless shelter. I can go to Helping Hands in Christ and see how they help people pay their bills. Now you say, well, government does do some good for people. They probably do, but they're horribly inefficient at it. And so you say, well, we, sh we need government to take care of people. It's like, these are the people that can't run the post office, all right? They have a monopoly on delivering letters and they lose a billion dollars a quarter. They're just not very good at it. So government is best that governs least, so you have the most amount of freedom, but government is also best that governs at a more local level. Doesn't make it perfect, but you can at least see it. Your city councilman or city councilwoman lives down the street. You can talk to her about, or him, about an idea about how you might have better sidewalks or how we might do something for the homeless in our community. But if you send it up here, we will throw lots of money at it and it won't be any better. Department of Education, we didn't have it when I was a kid. We have it now and our scores are maybe not any better than they were before we had the Department of Education. You say, well, gov should government be involved in education? Well, there wasn't any provision for it in the Constitution. You say, well, no government? What would happen? What would happen if the Department of Education disappeared tomorrow? What would happen to us? Probably nothing. The thing is, is most of your taxes that, that support your schools are from local taxes. In Kentucky, 95% of our taxes are from Kentucky taxes. And we have a Department of Education there, but we duplicate everything. So the Department of Education has had all these teaching standards and testing standards, and then Kentucky does the same thing, and they're spending millions of dollars doing the same thing the Department of Education is doing. We take all these tests and the teachers are, are forced to teach to the test and then in the end we're not really positive whether anybody's any smarter other than they can take these tests. And there still are those who argue that we're, we're not doing better. One of the things I think we could do in education is allow more freedom.